the uh, 17th Sunday after Pentecost. Two announcements before we get started. Number one, uh, we have our voters meeting today, and that's at 12, 12 15. I hope you can make that. Also, uh, as you probably been noticing, we've been advertising a thing called Bridges of Hope, and that's happening tomorrow at 7 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall, and that has everything to do with our continued desire to educate our faith community on mental health and also create strong safety nets within our uh, our church here in regard to those who are uh, suffering from anxiety and depression. So hopefully you can find some time to make that tomorrow evening. It'll be a really, really good, really good presentation. Also, as you know, we came through the, uh, uh, through the Narplex. We're having our fish fry, and that's going to be November 6th. And tickets are on sale now, $10 per adult, $5 per child. And that's all uh, being done to help our, our tuition assistance program. Also, calendars are being sold as well. So that's an opportunity as well. So let us begin with our opening hymn. It's uh, Crowning with Many Crowns in Middle
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life.
The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, declares the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? When a righteous person turns away from his, un his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. For the injustice that he has done, he shall die. Again, when a wicked person turns away from wicked, the wickedness, he has committed and does what is just and right. He shall save his life, because he considered and turned away from all transgressions that he had committed. He shall surely live. He shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, are my ways not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from all the transgressions that you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Philippians chapter 2. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility counts, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
believe in Jesus merely because you want to believe that it's true? That you hope it's true? Do you ever believe in something just because you want to believe it to be true? That doesn't always get you anywhere. It usually doesn't. And it's usually a sign, a bad one. For instance, I often want to believe my wife won't get mad at me if the dishes are in the sink and she's not home and I'm sitting on my recliner watching television. I may want to believe she's not going to notice, but that's not a good idea. Because when she comes home, she would have thought, surely I should have been able to put those in the dishwasher, right? Wanting to believe something, what's that all about? See, something happens when you are not concerned with the truth and you want to believe something merely because, or you believe it just because you want to. Something happens and it has to do with you being concerned with self-interest. When you're not asking a question or wanting to believe the truth because of the reality of the truth, you are concerned with self-interest. The reason? The truth can be very inconvenient for you. Isn't that right? It can mess your plans up. Truth may have hurt your present ambitions, but in the end, you still want to be on the side of truth. Being on the wrong side of the truth does something else. It will cause you to try to defend a subpar argument for the sake of your own self-preservation. An argument that does not address the issue at hand. It tries to defend the self-interest at the expense of the truth, see? Let me give you an example. Mom says to her son, did you hit your sister? And then the son says and begins an argument as to why she bugs him. That's what we call a straw man argument. Have you ever heard of a straw man argument? It's when the argument belongs here, but because you really don't want the truth, you start an argument over here to protect your own self-interest. Another example would be the abortion issue. It's interesting to note that the abortion issue has to do with whether that is a living human being in the womb or not. That's the argument. Notice what happens with the argument against that. It's my body, my choice. My body, my choice has nothing to do with the argument. We're not talking about a gallbladder being removed. The reality of abortion, and whether it's, it's immoral or not, is whether that's a human being. But this is a straw man argument over there to protect your own self-interest when you're not really wanting to involve yourself with the truth. See how that works? It's very interesting. They asked Jesus, the high priests and the, uh, well, not the high priests, the priests and uh, the religious leaders, and it's so wonderful how Jesus says, uh, don't take my word for it. If you're really seeking the truth, don't take my word for it here. Truth has been pronounced and proclaimed forever. That's what he's doing. So we have our gospel lesson. It's actually around Tuesday of Holy Week. You've got to put yourself in the last week of Jesus' life. So Sunday would have been his triumphal entry, and that would have made a lot of noise in the area, right? Here comes this Jesus, the miracle maker, miracle worker, and he comes in, and then probably right away, or Monday, probably that Sunday, he comes in, and he cleanses the temple. And he says, you turned my father's house into a den of thieves. You merchandise the outer courts. And this is a house of prayer. This is where God's people comes to worship. And he cleanses the temple. And it's probably around Tuesday where they get enough guts to go up to Jesus and say, who gives you the authority to do these things? Now, they're asking about his entire authority, but these last two events that happened are really big, and they want to know. And they're asking the question, not for the truth. They're asking the question 
because of their self-interest that they're trying to protect. What will be on the wrong side of the truth do in the long run? That's what hell is. Hell is eternity being on the wrong side of the truth and you trying to protect your self-interest. That's what is meant by the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. You don't want to be on the wrong side of truth. But they're asking the question for self-preservation. They don't want to know the answer. They're only interested in themselves. So by what authority, Jesus, are you doing these things? What gives you the right? And Jesus' response is so wise, I hope every one of us hear what he's saying. He doesn't say, my authority. He doesn't even seem to say, my father's authority. He could, and he would be absolutely right. But what does he do? He brings up John the Baptist. He goes back to the proclaimer of the truth before him. He's going back, and what he's saying is, don't take my word for it. Take history's word for it. Take what has been proclaimed for it. That's the reason why I stand here. Because I come to fulfill. I come to fulfill what has been true. The truth that has been spoken of throughout the ages, I have come to fulfill those things. So Jesus is bringing the discussion to the witness of himself as opposed to himself. Why is he doing that? To show us he's not a Jim Jones guy. He's not a cult leader. He doesn't claim things because he's claiming them himself. He's claiming things because it has been prophesied throughout all of history. And you can take a look and know that it's true. So he looks to John. And he says, how did you deal with John? You answer that, and then you'll actually have the answer yourself. But I'll go ahead and confirm it. That's what he's doing. And you go back all the way through Moses and the prophet. What, are you, what did you say about John? Well, if you go back to the time these same people confront John, what's John doing? John is the last and greatest of the prophets of the Old Testament. And his job is to tell people he's coming. The, the, the Messiah is coming in a person. Now repent and be baptized, every one of these, be prepared for Jesus, the Savior. And people are repenting and they're, they're, they're getting baptized into the Jordan River and then the religious Pharisees, the same group of people that don't have any concern for the truth. Ask John what his authority is too, don't they? What does John say? You're a brood of vipers. You're not ready for the kingdom. You're not even close. You're a brood of vipers. You don't see them in the water. What's happening? They're engaged in strong man arguments. They're engaged in asking questions to preserve what they already hold as their own truth in order to protect what they consider their status. So they get together and after Jesus says, answer this first. They get together and they say, well, we're in a predicament here, boys. If we say this, then this. If we say this, then this. What are we going to do? If we say, yeah, John was right, then, then we should believe that Jesus is the Messiah. If we say that John was wrong, then the people are going to be very angry because they believe it. So let me ask you. Where do you say Jesus gets his authority? What is true? Every one of us has to deal with this, and it might mess up your plans. What is true? If somebody else, some other religious leader stands up, we ought to ask the same question too, right? What would Mohammed say? Let's take Mohammed the leader of Islam. Supposedly in 609 AD, he was visited by the angel Gabriel. I'm here to tell you he wasn't visited by Gabriel, he was probably visited by a demon. How can you say that, Pastor Stecker? 
because there's no true witness to Muhammad and everything that he says. In fact, if you go and you research the witness to Muhammad, you've got him messing up the scriptures all the way back into the Old Testament. He messes them up big time. And they say, well, Jesus was a prophet. Yeah, he was assumed into heaven. He wasn't crucified and he wasn't resurrected. Isn't that interesting? When the prophecies say different. So I can stand here and tell you that Muhammad told people and are telling people today a lie. He's not a God. We can say that because of the testimony. Other religions, the same thing. Hindu, pantheism, Gnosticism, philosophies of the world, atheism. Take your pick. Look at the witness. What is the witness of what is being proclaimed? See, the only one who has a legitimate witness to show that he is who he is is Jesus. Nothing compares. You can't find it anywhere in the entire Old Testament. And Jesus just said, well, why don't we just go to John? How did you figure him out? Because John was prophesied too. Isn't this interesting? Dear friends, you should be in Bible study because you don't know the scriptures well enough. Because if you look into it, you'll find that Jesus has to say, what has the word of God said throughout history concerning me? And it's all there laid before us. And you come to Bible study and we will show you. When Jesus said, where did the authority of John come from? It equals what does the prophecies point to, which equals what you must conclude about Jesus. And it's going to mess you up. It's going to mess with your plans, your ambitions. It's going to make things very inconvenient, especially in a world that asks the questions for their own self-preservation. You will look at everything that you do differently. And you are a Christian, but the more you move into that, the more you understand it, it makes you think of things differently. It makes you proceed in life differently, radically differently. It makes you see the world differently, and it makes you not care about what the world thinks in regards to your faith in your Savior, Jesus Christ. See, John said, repent, the kingdom of God comes in a person. There he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There he is. In history through the prophecy, there he is. And Jesus says, here I am, the way and the truth and the life. And where did that come from? A history of truth. So when you ask the question, who are you, Jesus? Are you looking for an answer? Because he's either a very smart lunatic liar, or he's the Messiah, the Savior of the world. There's no in between. He's either got all of us fooled, and he's evil, or he is the Messiah that has been come into the world because of the love of God and the redemption of your soul. He's either the liar or the creator of the universe who sees you falter in life every day and still loves you because of who he is. And he's provided the way of eternal life through himself. You don't believe in Jesus merely because you want to, do you? I don't believe in Jesus because I want to. I believe in Jesus because he took me a rotten sinner redeemed me. And he's done so for you too. And there in the scriptures is the truth. It goes up against the world. The truth that will make you stand for something that you truly believe in. Because the truth has always been proclaimed from the scriptures. That's who you are and I am. And it is only by God's grace that he'll make that happen. Following the truth is not easy in this world. But God gives you the grace to do it. And to find the true freedom. Jesus doesn't answer, my authority is of God, even though that is true. He instead says, take a look. 
you will find I come to fulfill what John said, what Moses said, what Elijah said, what Isaiah said, what Ezekiel said, all the minor prophets said, all throughout history, written in the scriptures. Read it, take a look, study it, ask the question, ask the struck question in the pursuit of truth, and receive the answer that changes everything. And with all of it being true, knowing that your Savior is who he is, and his love for you, through the cross and resurrection, I know his promise to me will never leave. I'm his child because of his grace. He saved me from the falsehoods of this world. And his promise is true forever. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all of our human understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God.
to the many ways they bring the good news of your salvation to those in need and those around the world. Unite us, O Lord, that we may be of one mind and one will in doctrine, witness, and service. Bless us as we come to your table today to receive the body and blood of our Savior. Grant that we receive this holy communion, and in doing so, we may keep in holy hearts and holy lives. Thank you for the blessing of marriage, for all married couples, for that special union. We especially celebrate the union of David and Jennifer and Henry, who were married yesterday, Jason and Kimberly uh, Scholten, who were married last week, Chris and Elena Hartley, who are celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary, and Josh and Valerie Chester, uh, who are also married. Guide us in our voters' meeting today. May all our decisions here at Emmanuel be in conformity to your will. And grant to us all the things needful for our body and life and profitable for our salvation. And keep from us all things harmful that sustain in time we want and uh, guarded in time of prosperity we may endure in the day of our Lord's coming. And to the day of our Lord's coming, be judged worthy of eternal life through Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.